but it so then I had a party I have a um, we'll talk about this later too but I have like a monthly salon thing that I do in a bar that we play all kinds of music but I did a, a, a bass ensemble nutcracker party and we, for 1000 themed it was more 1000 themed and we I, I did an internet search for um, all the songs that are, are that have a thousand in the title and of course I came up with a thousand years from from Twilight, which is yeah. really not my cup of tea, but <laughs> <laughs> I did it. You are going to love this wide-ranging and fascinating conversation with today's guest. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are chatting with Ron Wasserman, who's been a frequently requested guest on the podcast. And Ron is longtime principal bassist for the New York City Ballet. In fact, he celebrated his thousandth Nutcracker performance last year. We talk about that and much more. And he's also the founder and artistic director of the New York Jazz Harmonic. He also, I love this description. This is on his website. Ron describes himself as follows. In this order, number one, a native New Yorker, number two, a fourth generation musician, number three, a veteran bassist, and number four, a composer. So we talk about those roles, Ron's backstory, and all kinds of content that Ron has put out on his website. And definitely check out the show notes for links to these different articles that he's written, including Ron's list of essential things to know to become a professional musician, what it's like playing over a thousand Nutcracker performances, thoughts on college teaching, and Ron's unintuitive guide to auditions. We didn't talk about that, but it's a great read for sure. I'd like to give a quick shout out before we start to our sponsors, A440 Violin Shop, D'Addario Strings, Steve Swan, String Bass, and Upton Bass. More on them later, but let's dig into this conversation with Ron Wasserman. your website i think you get your ron wasserman in four things and i want to see if i remember him lifelong okay. new yorker yes a fourth generation musician yes almost okay okay i found out that my great grandmother played the ukulele so that i think that counts okay i just okay. found that out recently really yeah. okay <laughs> wow and then bassist Yes, and bassist. composer, bassist right? And composer. Okay, okay, I got uh, that right. Yes. Yeah, I like to say life lifelong New Yorker because I have lived in New York my entire life. Okay, in, in New York State, including the suburbs, mm -hmm. uh, uh, except for a couple of years when I was at Indiana at, University. At Indiana. Yeah. Okay, okay, and we were just chatting before we got going yeah. about New York in the in the seventies, yes, and yes. and now here we are, twenty eighteen, and yes, times have changed. <laughs> Um, yeah, so just, just to finish that up about the fourth generation musician. So my, both my parents were professional musicians, um, okay. commercial, um, uh, songwriters and jingle writers. And my father was a drummer and my grandfather started off as a cellist in the Rochester symphony years ago. He quit music at one point. He became a writer. And then just within the last couple of years, I found out that his mother had played the ukulele. So I'm saying fourth generation musician, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. almost like the box, the old <laughs> box, but not quite. <laughs> and 
uh, you were singing at a young age, right? Yes, I have. You know, we're sitting, by the way, we're sitting here at Lincoln Center in the bass room. But um, I, um, boy, you, you've done your research. I, I, I try. Well, we got a lot to chill, like I said. Yes, right, right, right. <laughs> my, so I'll be, I can be a little bit expansive. Yeah, and you can, Yeah. So my first professional, well, my 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 mother was the um she was a she was a uh she was a stage mother type and she was like you're gonna do you're gonna do it you're you have talent you're gonna do it so she sent me to the audition for the metropolitan opera children's chorus which i did for a couple years and i actually went to the first rehearsal now this is all coming back to me and it conflicted with my my baseball summer camp which was down the street at the ymca and I was like, oh, I'm going to quit this, you know. And then she made me go back and go back into the opera, which was, of course, you know, which was a, a great ex- memory and experience that I've carried through my whole life. Yeah. Did um, you have some Bernstein contact? Leonard yes, Ber- Bernstein, Leonard Bernstein. Um, Bernstein conducted one of the first operas. It was, I think it might have been, uh, I don't know all the history, but it was one of the only times that he conducted at the Met. It was uh, just a few years after he, had, or within a couple of years after he had left being the music director of the Philharmonic, and he was, you know, so he this was his big return back to Lincoln Center. Mm-hmm. So that would have been in maybe 1971 or 72. I was about 10 years old. And you were living in the city at that point? Or? I was living, yes. I grew up in the Upper West Side, which is where Lincoln Center is, um, and um, spent pretty much my whole life until about age the early 30s when I got married uh, and then we moved to this yeah I had an apartment about as big as this room this base room here maybe a little smaller <laughs> and um my then fiance wife had a had a house in the in the close by suburbs so I decided to do that right and it's been like it's been over 25 years now in the suburbs which is hard to believe but I still feel like a, a city New Yorker because I've been back to Lincoln Center almost every day, you know, in the right. last 25 years. So Right. And some astounding numbers. I, and I remember seeing this pop up on Facebook, the Your Thousandth yeah. Nutcracker, yes. which I would, I would love to dig into. Yes. Having played, I think I only hit like 80 or yeah. 90. So right. And that I felt like was, right. you know, a run. Uh, well, let's see. So I, um, I, I hit my 1,000th Nutcracker. Um, last December and we, we just started keeping count as, as a joke. And then we estimated all the people who had been in the orchestra before us. Um, and we have quite, I wish, I wish we were in season now. I'd go ask the, um, the librarian to uh, dig out the sheet. So we keep it on our part. And whenever we get a new part, we have to religiously, you know, transfer these numbers over. And then once a year, you know, all even all our subs, you know, they have to keep track of their <laughs> their number, and we keep this up. So I I'm one, the, only the third person to um, um, hit a four figure, and I'm sure there are other people in, around the world, you know, who are more. But there were only two people who were more than me. One of whom was my teacher, David Walter who used to play in the orchestra. Actually, he played in the orchestra when I did come into the orchestra for a number of years. And another gentleman named Harold Schachner, who uh, is still alive. He's he's in his 90s. He retired about, um, I would say, 15 years ago or so. And I actually bought his bass when he retired. So his bass has played... <laughs> <laughs> he he was at twelve hundred, and then I took his bass, and I'm at about a, you know over a thousand. So this bass has paid played thousands of Nutcrackers. Those notes are baked into yes, the they are resonance baked in. of the instrument. <laughs> but it so then I had a party. I have a um, we'll talk about this later too. But I have like a monthly salon thing that I do in a bar that we play all kinds of music. But I did a a, a bass ensemble Nutcracker party, and we for 1000 themed it was more 1000 themed mm-hmm. and we i i did an internet search for um all the songs that are are that have a thousand in the title and of course i came up with a thousand years from from twilight which is yeah. really not my cup of tea but <laughs> <laughs> i did a i did a an arrangement for six bases of twilight um, and then there was a Fats Waller song called uh, "A Thousand Dreams of You," so we sang that song at the at the at the party. So it was fun. Wow, that's yeah. Ed. Uh, so 
spent all those first years saved for those couple of years at IU here yes. in New York yes. and yes. and singing at, but then also obviously bass came into your life at yeah. some point was that your first instrument playing um, well you know how uh, all musicians you know you try various uh, people yeah. try various things and, and are they either stick or they don't yeah and bass stuck with me i think i i did take piano lessons for a number of years um it never stuck i have no technique um took guitar lessons i have a little technique obviously that changes over because i do i've played electric bass as long as i've played the upright bass um and um I stopped singing when I um, was in high school. I was actually pretty good as I, I listened to a couple of recordings, you know. I actually sang on a couple of professional jingles, which, you know. I, really? There's a tape out there or something. Yeah, because my mother was a professional jingle singer, and, you know, occasionally they need a, a kid, you yeah. know, so she brought in her, her kid. That'd be a fun tape to have. Yeah, honor. yeah. And... Um, and then I sort of made a conscious decision saying, I, I like to express myself. The bass just worked better for me musically. And now I can't sing at all. I try to sing and it's like, oh my God. You know, my wife tells me, please don't sing anymore. You know. <laughs> Who is your first bass teacher? Uh, my first bass teacher, my first private bass teacher was... Um, just happened to be a guy a couple blocks away from me in the neighborhood who is actually quite a, a well-known um, um, musician, Jay Lenhart. He's a very famous jazz oh, bass sure, player. Oh, yeah. sure, yeah. He just happened to live a couple blocks away from me, and it was like, oh, bass lessons, and sure. And this was back in the day when Jay was very busy. Besides being a jazz player, he was very busy as a commercial guy. Mm -hmm. And often I would show up to my lesson and he would have a note on his door i shouldn't really say this but jay sorry 40 <laughs> years later <laughs> sorry i have a gig i can't make our lesson this week you know so i'll understand if you if you uh you know if you want to quit but i kept yeah. going back i studied with him for a couple of years and then um i went to somehow i don't know how i got into studying with commercial guys um, I had another guy who's pretty well known also in the bass world now, Ken Smith, who was who was um, one of the first guys to invent like the real classy handcrafted electric bass. Right. Yeah. And he was just doing that back in the day when I was studying, when I studied with him for about a year. And, you know, Arco orchestral sort of school bass playing was not really his thing but you know he was maybe like a couple lessons ahead of me mm -hmm. in the in the Simondel <laughs> book but it, it worked you know yeah. two lessons ahead is yeah, fine that's enough <laughs> and um then i you know after college a different level of teacher but you know. right right and was Jewel? Did you go to Juilliard first? Was I went your... to I went to Indiana for undergrad. Indiana for undergrad. Okay. Yes. And um, speaking of, I don't want I don't want this to sound like name dropping, but uh, I I went. I was a sort of you know everybody has an ego. I was like, okay, I'm I'm from New York. I'm coming to this. You know, I came from music and art high school. Um, I'm kind of a you know I feel like I've got some street cred here. Yeah. And I showed up to Indiana. I forget why i mean we don't have to go into why i chose indiana as opposed to some place in new york maybe i had some friends there or sure but um i get there and literally i think it was literally the first day um i met i heard this guy playing i was like holy we're not going on the radio <laughs> but um what the hell is that i've never heard anything yeah. like that and i and i go and i meet this guy and he goes um hi my name is edgar meyer what's your name and I'm a I'm a sophomore, and I was a freshman, and it was it was a um, a life changing experience. I'm still recovering from because you know as as we all know, um, this was before he was a you know an international phenomenon. Yeah, he was he had all that talent was like just readily apparent. It was like in your face. It was like you know there was no escaping it at that age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was maybe 19, and I was 18 or something. And um, it's, I literally, I'm still recovering from the shock of meeting this talent in your face. And it's been an, an unbelievable inspiration, you know, for the last 40 years, you know. Wow. Ima imagine showing up 
Yeah. <laughs> somebody, you know, I think we've all had that experience where we encounter somebody at that at that maybe not Edgar Myers level, but yeah. that that level oh, that yeah. we're so clearly yeah, yeah. you know beyond where we're at. But wow, same same kind of playing, same kind of. Oh way. yeah, he had his whole concept going. Oh, well, he was you know he was refining it, but he had his whole concept. Boy, right I would there. have loved to have been a fly yeah. on the wall, and because yeah. this was Stuart Sankey at the time, yes. right? Uh, Stuart, Stuart Sankey, Sankey was... Edgar Meyer lesson. Boy, I wish there was yeah. u- video footage of that. Um, fascinating. I would, I... Oh yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of us were who the smart ones of us <laughs> went into. We just sat in Edgar's practice room and watched him practice. Yeah, you know, and he was already. Um, I mean, we you know, there's certain people you know are going to be a star. And he was already organizing certain concerts and writing music. And he said, you do this and you do that. And we'd look, okay, we'll do whatever you want. And we played various concerts that he was wow. he was organizing. And Stuart, of course, was, you know, I mean, he was like, well, whatever you want to do. Right. <laughs> that was that was Stuart Sankey's um, um, genius in that he um, did not, if he saw talent, he would let that talent go in, yeah. in the direction, you know, because you can't, you know, the... The back in that day, the um, you know the, the the way to study bass in college was pretty much um, orchestral and very light solo playing. You know, right. like uh, the um, not even the Dittersdorf Concerto had not even made a re, you know a return. It was more like the uh, I can't even remember the names of those pieces. Right, uh, right. You know, yeah. the Capuzzi Concerto. There we go. That there was, we go. That was the you know sort of the the solo playing. Wow, so you're so you you, you come from this this uh, musical background in New York, and yeah. then you've studied with you know maybe maybe just coincidentally, but these commercial guys, but right. you kind of know the pretty you know diverse range of musical experiences outside of the orchestral yeah. world. Then you're at Indiana, at, in what I imagine, even though Edgar Meyer is there, probably yeah. the the training from Stewart and orchestral yeah. and then a lot of yeah, the other yeah. people probably similar thing. So what was in your mind in that undergrad? Were you thinking? I'm I'm gonna go get a job in the Boston Symphony. I mean, what, uh, what are you thinking? I, I think back in my my early undergrad days in col in high school uh, into a first few years of undergrad, I think I I still had eyes to be a jazz player, mm. mm-hmm. um, and um, I was you know pretty serious about that. Um, but for whatever reason, um, I slowly changed over to um, playing, thinking about doing orchestra auditions, which I did a number of. Um, And um, just, you know, I I can't even say that there was a turning point. It just, you just kind of gravitated. Actually, I do remember one thing that sort of really turned me, turned me off of jazz back in the day. Um, this was before um, you could not smoke in in clubs, and it, and I was I've always been very se- overly sensitive to cigarette smoke, and it just I just couldn't do that anymore. You know, I was working, I just couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. Of course, twenty years later, if I, it may have had a different career path. Yeah. You know? But who could have imagined at yeah, that point? And I, I know you come back reeking of smoke, everything yeah. feel, and yeah. yeah, not as much smoking in the orchestral. Right. World. I mean, you have to, the, you know, you have to, um, <clears throat> you know, you have to find your your way. But that yeah. was one of the, the ways that I mean, I have some other reasons that I that I stopped. But oh, I will, Indiana, and then what was next for you? Uh, I I did Indiana for uh, it was two or three years, and I came back to to New York because, as I said, I wanted to be a jazz player. And yeah. there were some great, great um, had a great jazz department at Indiana. It was one of the first places that offered doctorates mm-hmm. in jazz. Actually, um, David Baker was the head of the department there, who's you know an unbelievable educator. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but for some reason I had, you know, since I was from New York, I had a lot of connections and they were saying, when are you going to come back? You know, we've got the gigs ready, blah, blah, blah. So I did come back. I finished up my undergrad uh, for, I think it was one year at Manhattan. And that year coming back turned me into sort of, you know, I was changing. So, mm-hmm. um, and then I felt ready to audition for Juilliard um, for Masters, which I had not felt um coming out of high school ready and I didn't want to audition for it unless I felt like it was a, it was a foregone conclusion that I was going to get in mm-hmm. um, and I so it was like I'm going to audition now and you know, I knew I was going to be accepted it was you know it was kind of kind of gratifying to be accepted but um, so 
you know, I did a master's at Juilliard. It was like, so I did, I still had a few credits or something. Yeah. It was like a three year master's back in the day. And you were studying with David Walter? David Walter, okay. yes. Okay, so what was David Walter like? Any good David Walter stories? Oh, I, 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 have, like... I have good, bad. <laughs> okay. I have so many. I'll, let's, let's do the good ones. Okay. So David Walter, um, he's another absolutely singular person who has influenced me for you know, my whole life. Um, we, so I, met, I only met him when I was – actually, let's, let's go back. <laughs> Let's go back, uh, back in my day. So there was he had he had the music minus one album. So right, everybody remember that. And on the cover of the album, you know, I said, "Wow, this guy." You know, and this was like when you were a kid, you know, junior high school, whatever. You're like, "Wow, this is amazing." Mm -hmm. You know, and you look at the picture and you study the picture. You know, how does he hold the bow or whatever it was? And then my grandmother was a subscriber to the New York City Ballet here for many years and and she for some reason had front row seats for the New York City Ballet so she would occasionally bring me and I spent my time looking at the people in the orchestra and in we're in the front row and there's David Walter who played in the New York City Ballet for many years and you know he was um sitting there very uh very maybe looking like he he didn't particularly want to be playing the Nutcracker for his 500th time or whatever it was. <laughs> but I thought, wow, this guy is like the most intense, serious, uh, you know, intellectual, yeah. um, no-nonsense person I've ever seen, you know, seeing him from 20 feet away. So then I met him years later and, and realized that he was an, a person with an incredible sense of humor, a real, actually one of the most brilliant people I, I've ever met. And at that time, he was in his probably late 60s, early 70s. Um, and he was just a fountain of, of of knowledge. And I was like, well, I more from the force of his personality, he was like, this is going to be my teacher at Juilliard. You know? so, and back in that time, there were basically two people to study with the Juilliard. There were two main choices. There was him and Homer Mensch. And, right. You know, Homer Mensch was the serious, intellectual, no nonsense, mm -hmm. and David Walter was mm -hmm. the, um, you know, sort of the worldly person. Um, so that was 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 very, um, and he became you know a great influence. And he was actually an incredibly brilliant person. Um, in his undergraduate days, he had gone to City College for um, a math degree. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, before he became a musician and then of course he, this is, you know, probably in the 19, um, <clears throat> 19, late 1920s, early 1930s, you know, he became a professional musician after that. So, um, he, he was, he had so much energy, even his seventies. I remember after I had left Juilliard and I, I hadn't seen him for a number of months, I saw him running down the street and he had like all his students were huffing and puffing behind him trying to keep you know these are uh, college students literally trying to keep up with this guy he was like taking them to some art exhibit okay. down and That's he was like image. he's like come on you want to come he was like ron you want to come and i was like sure you know and and we and i joined the group of kids literally, yeah, literally could not keep up with him he had so much energy so um i mean i have so many stories his his main his main um, influences in his life were Tuscanini and Pablo Casals, mm -hmm. who he had both played with both of them. He played it with the NBC Symphony for many years. And his, I heard all his Tuscanini stories. Oh, this must have been great. Uh, multiple, multiple times. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to go into all the <laughs> <Right>. Tuscanini <laughs> stories, but he idolized this person and Casals too. Um, and, um, you know, then I got into the orchestra with him, and we were stand partners for many years. And I, I heard the stories all over again. You know, from a different uh, perspective. <laughs> so, so it's, so study with David Walter mm -hmm. at Juilliard, and then you had been the jazz had been on your mind, but you were making this transition. Yeah, and then. Uh, what happened next? I, at some point, the the uh, ballet job yes. happened. Was that right after Juilliard? Uh, that or? was probably a few years after I okay. graduated. I had okay. you know freelanced in the in New York at that time, and that was still. This is sort of the mid '80s. Mm -hmm. You could there was still a memory of a um, a memory of a of an idea that you could sort of say, "I'm a musician," and expect the phone to ring. 
and you know which almost doesn't exist anymore now you know mm-hmm. without without you know major hustling which i want to talk about yeah the, I, the me, profession too. Of, me too of music now <laughs> So I did, I did that for a few years and, you know, it was still, you know, you still had to wait your turn. You know, you were Mm -hmm. competing with a lot of well-established people. I had some, some good gigs, you know, some nice paying gigs with sub here and there and, um, you know, did a bunch of $35 gigs back in the day, which some of those don't pay that much more these days, you know, um, $35 went a little bit more back in the day. Um, and I was doing the audition circuit at that time too. Um, and I was lucky enough to, at one point get, you know, I, the job that I won lucky enough was in my hometown. So mm-hmm. maybe that was cause I didn't have to fly there with the base and you know, who knows, you know, there's something, there's something about, and I've talked to several people who have, well, obviously I've talked to a lot of people that have won jobs, but there is a commonality and even that this among people I haven't talked to winning a job in your hometown or winning a job in a place you spend a lot of time. And mm-hmm. I don't know what that psychological comfort factor is or yeah. how it contributes. And obviously a lot of people fly somewhere or drive somewhere and they do win, but I think there's something to that. Yeah. Uh, that, that just, and maybe on some subconscious level, but just that, that. I'm yeah. I mean, obviously it's not, you know, it's not a given, but right. you know, there is some right. level of comfort and obviously, you know, when you're talking about those, I don't, I don't particularly want to get into audition discussion. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've had this with many people but um you know sometimes being nervous gets you on your game you know for me for me i've always been the less nervous i am the more i'm on my game Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. um so um yeah there is definitely something about a comfort level you know the i've i've heard from colleagues a couple i'm 42 colleagues Mm -hmm. maybe 20 years older than me and it is like what you're describing, you know, especially right. when I live back in Chicago or in San Francisco or I, certainly in New York, like I, I'm a musician, the phone rings. I joined the musicians union. Yeah. I'm getting gigs. And I just, it seems like a, a myth to me. I can't imagine that. Right. But that was, th- that was a thing or even... like, okay. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was just, it was, it was petering out. I mean, there are still people in New York who can do that because yeah. there are so many opportunities. There's Broadway shows. Right. And there's still a little bit of commercial work, and there's a very active jazz scene of people doing projects. But um, it it you know you cannot just rely anymore on on the on the um, phone ringing for these things. I mean, you you have to really really hustle now, and there's not as much room for. It, it was also like sort of anybody who could who wanted to could sort of get into that at least on a small scale. But yes, it was like you joined the union and it was like, okay, well now, you know, here I am, you know, and, and, but it it has changed so much, you know, this is over 30 years ago, you know, when, when did that start to change? I mean, I guess it started to change maybe a bit before you entered the scene. And then these are super wide questions. So possibly like, why, what are some of the factors that, that, Gosh, you know, I've been I've been thinking, (laughs) I think so much about this. And, you know, you never know. I mean, well, back, let's take my parents generation, you know, when they were professionals uh, into the 1950s into the 60s. There were not every every university in the United States was not producing highly qualified um, degree, you know, top quality players Mm -hmm. like they are now. And so as just as far as numbers of professional musicians, you know, there was a little bit more room to, you know, there was a little bit more of an economic um, need for the actual players. Not like there is now where there are just so many, I mean, there's an unending supply of people who are absolutely completely qualified to just plug into what almost whatever you need to mm-hmm. be done. So there, there definitely is going to be some some fall off. That that's an that's a big one. And and the the the, um, you know, I, it's a concern of mine as a as a as a musician when I look at this. That part is growing. There's more and more programs yeah. that come up that are doing this now. And as the economics, the jobs are not increasing. There's a certain stasis, and there's a certain uh, there's a certain number of new new jobs, new projects. I won't say jobs, but projects being put together and 
people raise their own funds for them. But yeah, that's that's one thing. And this episode is brought to you by Diderio Strings. Our friends at Diderio want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. Each time the string winds around the peg, be sure that it lays neatly next to the previous coil as opposed to crossing over itself, which increases the risk of breaking. Wind each string from the middle of the peg outward, making sure never to rub up against the peg box wall, which also increases risk of breakage. Learn more at orchestral.diderio.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. And Steve has been researching top re-graduation for many years. Here's Steve on the topic. I found some old uh, diagram bass tops in an old violin making book that had violins, violas, cellos, and only four basses from kind of the classic period, the early 1800s. And I took a pattern of uh, kind of a topographical map of thicker in the center under the bridge, and then you know the thinnest is right near the edges, you know, just before it flares out and gets strong again. And I put in some measurements that I thought would work. And we use that as a general pattern for top graduation, and it really works. You would be amazed how well this technique works. I've been impressed time and time again at how immediately a bass speaks after coming from Steve's shop and how resonant and beautiful and open the sound is. Learn more at steveswanstringbass.com and thanks for sponsoring the podcast, Steve. Yeah, it's kind of, I, I've, I also have thought a lot about <laughs> that. Sure. And if you look at the, at when that started to, that decline started to happen maybe uh, in the 70s, let's mm -hmm. say. That's also right around the same time that massive university campus expansion was happening. Yes. And yes. I've talked with a, a, a friend and colleague of mine, Drew McManus, who is a orchestra consultant and mm -hmm. great writer and really good thinker yes, about this. I've read and, some of okay. stuff, yeah. and, and he he and I have spoken about how the uh, university music department is one of the cheapest departments to set up, actually. So right. as a university is looking to diversify, um, music is something that can be added fairly easily. And then just another thought I've had, and I love your thoughts on this too. There's, there's an, there's an inherent, uh, the, I think you read, you wrote about this once, like the university education industrial complex or something yeah. that not those words exactly right. maybe, but the, but the thing is you recruit people or you, you hire faculty and the faculty are there. They're, they're kind of in this, uh, worker bee mode. They're try they need students to justify yes. their job, right? Yes. It, they're not, they're, they're doing something that, and it sounds evil, but it's just the, the system. Right. They, if they don't have students, they don't have a job or their job's not viable or their right. job's not going to be full time or whatever. So they are in here. They are motivated to recruit you into their studio. Oh Yes by whatever means necessary, maybe, let's say. And and so and then this is a massive discussion because there's the rise of cost of education, oh, yes. blah, blah, blah. But just that one piece of it, I think that that's, if I, you radiate that out to, I think I counted over 400 double bass program, collegiate bass programs in the U.S. Wow. alone yeah. at this point. So I, I, I think that that plays into it to yeah. an extent. Well, yeah, I mean, to put it, put it a little succinct, succinctly, the, you know, the question that I ask is, is, is this, you know, I don't want to use that term really, this industrial complex, but is it serving the needs of the profession or is it self self feeding, which I think a lot of it is, unfortunately, um, you know, not to say that those aren't really great jobs and I'm happy for people who do that. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the reasons I actually don't do that much teaching, you know, mm -hmm. because it's like, it's, it's like, am I serving what what are you serving there? You know, it's a, it's a problem. It's a, it's a definitely it's a big problem. You know. Yeah, it's it's a tough thing. Uh, it's a tough thing to wrap your brain around because like yeah. the, the thirteen year old wants to play bass. That's a beautiful thing. You know, right. we shouldn't deny people, but but the the professional realities are something that that also I think that the the way the type of faculty that tend to be hired tend to be people that are. It's just this orchestrally oriented yes. track that's fairly narrow or jazz might be a, a little more open minded. Maybe not. Yeah. A, I'm not I don't know that world as much, but but that though the type of people that uh, are in that track tend to recruit other people in with that mentality who might not have any of these other skills. Right. And I know you've written about that. Yeah. too. Uh, talk about the talk about the professional side of sure, things. Sure. Sure. So um, 
actually, you know, what has really incredibly boomed is these these degree places giving out degrees in jazz. Yeah. Now, when I I was at the tail end of of the time when you went to 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 music college, you were going to study music, mm -hmm. quote music unquote, um, and you know they didn't really teach you the nuts. I mean, I as I say, I I had. David Baker on the faculty there, so you pick up things. But it wasn't like, okay, you're going to study this specific thing. You're going to study music. And now it's it's even gotten more compartmentalized where you're going to study classical music or jazz, which is, I think, a disservice to um, students. And I've actually asked some of the young people who I play concerts with, um, you know, when you were at Juilliard, did you get a chance to take any lessons from... Um, Ray Mace, who's one of the yeah. uh, trumpet classical trumpet players at Juilliard, and he's like, "No, I really wanted to, but I didn't get. It. I only got a chance to study with my jazz teacher." I was like, "It's it, that's to me is a disservice to to the students." So, yeah. um, you know, so that has gotten very compartmentalized, and now the classical music industry in the world is very has is very well established in this country. I call it the European musical tradition mm -hmm. with the you know thousands of people who play in professional orchestras and who have fought for through their unions over the years for you know pretty pretty um pretty good jobs yeah. you know that you can have a, you can make a living at these right. jobs and without too much worry of course obviously everybody worries their orchestra is going to go out of business but yeah. you know while it's in business <laughs> You still have a job, and it is supported by a very, very robust philanthropic community, um, and who are dedicated people on their boards, you know. And so the the philanthropic uh, system to feed, you know, here's the irony: uh, European tradition is very robust in America. Um, <laughs> Jazz, the great American art form, it is that does not exist. The the whole philanthropic support. There's a few organizations that have tapped into it. Um, jazz at Lincoln Center, um, San Francisco Jazz. Yep. There's a couple other here and there, um, and there's who are in the who are doing it as well as the orchestras do it. Maybe a handful at most. Yeah. And consequently, we have all these musicians who are coming out towards that career goal in mind, where there are absolutely no jobs. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know. I know Jazz and Lincoln Center has one big band of full-time musician jobs. Okay, so that's sixteen. Compare that to thousands of of classical music jobs. You know. Yeah, and and we think it's hard to get a job yes, right, in the classical right. world. That's a great observation. Right. SF Jazz, same thing, right? right. And I, I don't know if I can even name one hand's worth of organizations. Right. One, you know, I can't. I don't think I can name five. Yeah. Wow. So that is a that is a big concern um, that you know we have decided to put that we. I mean, the collectively uh, society has decided. I mean, I work on that you know yes like i have my own jazz organization very 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 small scale the new york jazz harmonic mm -hmm. that i have incorporated as a nonprofit, and we do mm -hmm. some fundraising but you know i'm just me and i don't mm -hmm. have a board of you know 40 people who have connections i mean obviously that would be a dream to right. have that but you know i i was absolutely shocked last year i went to the jazz conference um at, at jazz at lincoln center and they let slip that their budget was thirty million dollars a year, and I was like, "This is, you know, rivaling one of the the big orchestras, you know." Yeah. And I was like, "This is, you know, there. It's almost like they are." And I'll probably be saying a few controversial things here, which I'm sure you'd love for your podcast. <laughs> it's okay, okay um, by me. <laughs> um, you know, it's almost it's almost robbing what. What you know for one organization to be taking ninety five percent of the philanthropic d dollars available for you know this part of American art music when I say art music I mean anything that isn't commercially viable right. I don't just mean you know experimental right, you know. right. Um, 
it's it's almost a disservice to the music, you know, even though, and as I say, they are only employing, you know, 17 or 16 full-time musicians. Yeah. You know, they have a vast people, way more people working in their office. That's a tremendous but, amount of power and yeah. resources, uh, you know, in this one small organization. I, mean, I never even really thought about it in that yeah. way. I mean, they do incredible, you know, it's an incredible course, musical yeah. organization. This is not yeah. to take away from any of that. But so, so then we have all these... Absolutely. And I'm, I have to say sometimes when I, and I work with a lot of young jazz musicians who come out of um, um, conservatories, the, I find some of them are absolutely even better musicians than those people who are able to take those, those orchestra musicians because mm -hmm. they're even, I, I won't say better musicians, but they're more well-rounded. They can do this. They can, most, almost all of them compose their own music. All of them can do commercial stuff. Um, if they have to improvise, obviously, you know, so, um, and, you know, so they have, so that leads into, you know, some other things, which we'll get to yeah, in a minute, please. but yeah. yeah. Wow. So, so, um, there's the fundraising component, yeah. the extra off of the instruments, you know, there's the, right. the, then there's the, I think I doing my homework. I think I read you, you writing about audience building as right. being a big part of it too, right. Right? right? right, right, Which I've I can't tell you how many concerts I've gone to, classical or otherwise, where there are almost as many people on stage as yes. in the audience, right? So obviously a major, yes, major uh, issue. So so I you know I want to preface I want to pre preface <laughs> or pre a prequel saying that you know I have over these these 30 years now I've been so lucky to have this steady job so that I yeah. can experiment and do all this you know without having uh been at the ballet here now but one the one main thing I've learned about the ballet is that dance uh there's a built-in audience for dance more than even more than classical music because People people love dance, and I hate to say this as a musician, but people love dance more than than <laughs> classical music fans love. They will come, they will come to small concerts, big concerts, and every, everywhere. And there's also, um, you know, there's so many young um, girls, mostly girls, but boys too, who take dance as yeah. children, and it stays with them their entire life. Um, and they come. So the New York City Ballet has had its it's economic problems over the years, but, um, they, you know, can count on, uh, one to 2000 people to come almost every night for mm -hmm. their, for their performances. Um, the, the theater here seats 2,500. So their idea was at one point a number of years ago, um, we, they closed one section of the theater. So it fills it up. You know, the one section is closed and empty. Um, but the rest of it, the 2000 seats are filled. So, and yes, yeah, so audience building. So if you're going to now come out of, of a conservatory and say, I'm a professional musician and you can't wait for the phone to ring. So the next thought is, well, shall I, you know, make my own thing happen? Yeah. And a lot of people do that. I think also here's another thing that um, jazz people young artists coming out of conservatories are are a little bit more in tune with because as i say they don't expect right. those you know um so it's one thing to put your art on stage and i i say to people the worst possible thing idea you can have is to put your art on stage end of story because <laughs> you will, yeah. as you just said, you will do that, and you know it. You might as well have a rehearsal. Right. You know, crickets. Yeah, yeah you're going to have crickets, <laughs> and so you know. And listen, it is hard to write music and think of a concept and put a program together, and um, that's a full time job. Yeah, but you have to take fifty percent of your time at least. And think well. Okay, here's the audience, and is it, you have to have publicity, you have to have, um, you have to sell tickets, you mm -hmm. have to have. Um, well, PR is is important. PR and publicity are very important. You know, if, if nobody hears about you, right. you have to do social media. Mm -hmm. You have to. Um, you have to do everything you can think of, and still getting people out of their houses these days is um, not easy because there's so much entertainment in your house. Now, yep. some people just 
are, you know, you can make a living now just doing, you know, videos or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, uh, YouTube videos, not so much in the music business, but, you know, that's more of a publicity thing right. for musicians, but people. Right. So that's the second job. The third job is, is the fundraising. How are you going to pay for this? Because chances are with art music, you are not going, it is not going to be commercially viable in that your the ticket sales are going to be more than the cost right especially right. if you want to sell pay yourself a little bit mm -hmm. and for almost all the things that i put on i don't even expect to pay myself anything in fact i'm way in the negative you know right. i put money into it right you know i'm i'm the main fund rate i'm the main donor for my own my own nonprofit, right. which is fine that's the way i've decided to do it but if you're Somebody who's, you know, you have to think of, well, I have to, and now that's a full-time job. Now, not only is fundraising a full-time, it's more than one full-time job. It's, it's a full-time job for grant writing, and it's a full-time job for, you know, individual philanthropy. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, I do a lot of projects with uh, my partner, Ashley Bowder, who's a principal dancer at the New York City Ballet. Now, a principal dancer at the New York City Ballet is a celebrity. Um, at least among a certain thing. So right. she can call up society friends and say, here's our project, um, X number of dollars. So most people don't have that. I certainly don't have that ability. Mm. Um, you know, uh, so you have to do grants, mm -hmm. which is a, literally a full-time job to apply for grants. In a fi fine art form, like yes. I, I've I've been involved in several nonprofits right. with like disastrous results in terms of grant writing. They're exactly. like, "Yep, we hired somebody, nothing." Right. You know, you know. right. So that's that, and as I say, the individual philanthropy. Now, uh, an organization like the New York Philharmonic, or even you know a smaller group like um, a slightly smaller group like let's say Fort Worth Symphony or whatever, mm -hmm. they have multiple people on staff who do just each one does individual giving you'll look at the masthead and it's individual giving grant writing um special events yeah. and so there's a number of full-time jobs there so you know the the over and and that's and then there's um production mm -hmm. besides the actual putting art on stage you know you have to have a, somebody helping you get you know stage hands yep you know so anyway it's not it's it's a it's not just putting your art on stage it's like you know and so here's the thing you know you come out as a as a as a young person who says i'm a professional musician and it is it's almost overwhelming and especially if you want to you say well i got to make a living you know i'm getting married i'm having a family whatever and but people are you know i'm i'm really you know, I see a lot of people do figure this. They do run this this gamut, and they they get things happening. Um, and that is, you know, you almost you have to be, you have to uh, be able to 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 do this now. It's a lot of skills that you yeah. didn't didn't probably need if you were going to school in the yeah. in the '60s or maybe even the '70s. I went to school in the '90s. Yeah. I zero percent of what you were just talking about was was covered in any yeah. capacity in any any class in any formal way despite right. this like, extremely expensive education that's changing a bit in some places but right, right. it is changing a bit I mean there's yeah. you, know, you have to take I mean I took uh, they offered uh, the business of music class back mm -hmm. in my day and I went to it and and I was and, and the first lecture the guy was talking about that he produced this record and. You know, Pavarotti was on it or whatever. And I was like, this has absolutely, you know, I'm never in my life going to be hiring Pavarotti <laughs> and figuring out this contract. And it was like, forget it. I dropped that yeah. class, you know, and and so and I but I don't think it's gotten that much better. Yeah, you know, you're still part, on your own. Yeah, I think part of it is that going back to that acad it's academics hiring academics for things. Yeah. You know, it's like someone and, and I, I'll, there are some great if we'll just use musical entrepreneurship, you know, type right. programs out there that are happening. But there are a lot. I've, I've also talked to a lot of people behind the scenes. They're like, this is a this is not the the. They're they're hiring someone who's just been on an academic track. They've never booked a yes. they've never booked a thing in their life. Yes. and they're supposed they're like I've heard of I've heard of booking gigs. Let's right. talk. But versus someone who's been out in the trenches, like what you're yeah. describing with the jazz harmonic and all the other projects, right. you know, right. it's a lot. It's a it's a lot of skills that um, 
even if you if you're paying lip service to him, it doesn't mean yeah that that someone who knows how to book Pavarotti right. is going to have a, a, right. anything to offer someone who's trying to like you know scrape together uh, enough to cover the cost yeah. of a jazz gig yeah. or series. Well, I mean, so, you know, I mean, this is not to say that there isn't music in the world. I mean, of course, you, you of know, course. but it's, you know, but and people do this, but it is this is, you know, you have to you have to do it. I mean, you know, when I see young musicians start their own chamber music groups, you have this you're the social media person, you know, and it is, you know, it, I'm incredibly admiring of that, you know, that you have to you have to find somebody you have to find some way of doing it you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and but now here's the thing so you are now let's go back to the classical side of it you're coming out and i have a feeling i mean i don't know juilliard was only back in my day you know even orchestra for bass it was a little different you know yeah they were only, you were only going to be a soloist right. and play the Beethoven concerto or whatever with an orchestra. And yeah. I was, you know, that was like beyond a pipe. I mean, that was, you know, that wasn't going to happen for 99% of people, mm -hmm. but that was the training. So I think still now, maybe the violinists are now, you know, thinking about, um, orchestra auditions a little <laughs> bit more, but those jobs now, so now you get out and there are, are, very few auditions for all instruments, you know, a, a few a year. And I think now, even up until 10 or 20 years ago or 10 years ago, it was still, okay, well, I'm, I have a chance. I have a chance. I think people are coming out now and saying, you know, I, I absolutely do not have a chance. This is impossible. If you look at the odds, there are, you know, 400, um, bassoon players who graduated this and there's three openings and, you know, you say, well, it's just a chance in hell that it's going to happen. So, yeah, maybe I'll do it and maybe I'll get lucky. But you have to. The realization is you cannot count on it. It's, yeah. it's just going to be a luck thing. Right. Right. And, you know, that is is going to be uh, very detrimental to the to the to the to part of the business that still is in those jobs who take that for granted that everybody's going to support them. Mm -hmm. um, like for instance, uh, about 15 years ago, I think there was uh, an orchestra that was on strike through the union and they, um, the orchestra management, this was still a little bit untenable. They said, forget it. You're all fired. We're going to hire, we're going to hire scabs. And nobody would take those those scab jobs because they felt that they were going to be blacklisted right. from life, which right. I totally got. That was, but I can see you can see a day coming when people are going to say, "Forget it. Why should I care? I'm never going to get one of those jobs anyway, so I'm going to do that." And I don't think that's going to be it's not going to be a particularly great thing because it's musician against musicians, but you can see it happening where an orchestra management is going to say, "Let's just do it and it's not going to hold." And, right. You know, they're going to say, "Well, it's not going to be the um, I'm trying to think of a city that uh doesn't have an orchestra because I don't want this to right. be personal." I know, yeah. <laughs> I'll get angry the, uh, emails from <laughs> the, uh, you know, the Key Largo. Okay, there we go. Do, do they, do they, <laughs> the Key Largo Symphony is going to say, forget it. We're not the Key Largo Symphony anymore. We're the Key Largo Philharmonic. And that's it. And there's yeah. going to be no recourse. And the union is getting weaker and weaker in that regard, unfortunately, you know, because I'm a longstanding, you know, union yep. member. Yeah, yeah, me too. And it's and you know, I I read the paper and I read the emails, and it's you know, it's it's and it's it's not not a good thing that the, it's the way it's going, but the way uh, the you know, it's just the tr economic trends and the trends yep. in unionization, and and yeah, I can see a time coming too where where. Um, the, yeah, because it is, there's a, and it's interesting people like a generation younger than me that are coming out of music school, that hopelessness yeah. you're describing. I've seen there, there's a yeah. very articulate 
trombonist named uh, Matt Waters, who mm -hmm. uh, wrote a wonderful piece called The Orchestral Dream is Dead, which right. ironically got some attention, and he ended up getting a job, oh, job yeah. in China teaching right. uh, in, some, in the Beijing Central Conservatory or something like that. So his frustrations, but his frustrations were so real. It was like, we all had these multi hundred thousand dollar loans that were burdened with, right. sold to us by people who didn't really understand the realities. They 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 were either sheltered from it or they got an orchestra job right. thirty five years ago and they were sort of saying the same thing over and over to the same group of people and and yeah it was a real it made me really sad um, but it made me really think about it because that that was a level of hopelessness that I certainly I was, think I was still a little more in that generation of there's a chance you know, right. it's hard but right. work hard right. and so yeah that is a it's a disturbing trend and then if we're training people like this still not with these grant writing fun, fundraising you know um, yeah. uh, skills that's an issue. But then if you right. look, and I'd love your thoughts on this, uh, if we look at the music curriculum of a school, like the, the, the line I always hear is, well, what do we take out? If we right. want to add this, do we take right. out music history? Right. Do we take out music theory? You know, so it's a, it's a conundrum. Yeah. So that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, what do you do with, what do you take out to uh, put in the entre music entrepreneurship? Right. I mean, maybe you do get rid of, um, well, you know, People people want to learn, um, and the assumption is that music and entrepreneurship is something. Entrepreneurship is something you learn on your own. Maybe music right. history is something you're still getting. You know, maybe that is something that is going to be well. You have to learn, you know, yeah. music history on your own because totally. it's as far as you know. There's a whole uh, trope these days that education is purely a means to your economic life you know right right and which is sad because yeah, that's not the classic educational yes, no. setup right yeah it's like and you know there's people are actually you know you read magazine articles do is it cost worthy or whatever i calculated the cost of how much i would make versus you know it's like okay well but what about you know just education for the human for the for the brain which is you know desperate for knowledge you know yeah so, but there has to be a certain amount mm -hmm. when you're talking about music college and spending all these resources, obviously music is a great education. It's one of the most important, it's easy for us to say, right, right. one of the most important things that humans can strive for. Um, but, uh, so there has to be a certain amount of thought towards yeah. your future economic life and maybe music entrepreneurship is more important than music history right now it's a t it's a thing i thought about a lot and especially my wife being a radiologist now mm -hmm. which that is trade school right right it's right. It, it costly trade, and I, I think it's good that it, you know you want those people to be well trained that is trade school um music is set up as trade school, but it's really becoming more like like art history or yeah. poetry or something. There's it's beautiful to study. There are all sorts of right. things that are beautiful. I don't think the expectation of a job outside of teaching that exact same thing at a university or something is is um, yeah diminishing. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, back in my day, also, and I, you know, I'm not that old. I'm right. only I'm <laughs> going to be 57 tomorrow, actually. But I paid for my music, my f six years of music college without major loans that didn't take me more than a little bit to pay off, mm -hmm. you know. And it was, you know, I think the tuition at uh, Manha at uh, Manhattan School or Juilliard was maybe 5000 a year. Yeah. And I lived, I lived with my mother while I was going to Juilliard because mm -hmm. there was, you know, rents in Manhattan were very expensive back then yeah. even, you know. Yeah. So... I was able to pay for it, but now with hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars of loans, you, you, you know, you have to think about, you, you, you have to think about some of the economic aspects of, of studying music. I mean, I fully went into, when I graduated high school, I was fully into going to music college because that was going to be my profession, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, the, just as slight aside, just to, to get this on tape, you know, like you read a lot of, of as far as education and music, you know, you, you read so many articles about how educate music, studying music and learning music and listening to music, it turns certain things on in your brain. It helps you with math. It helps you with this. It helps you with that. It's, 
you know, it helps you study business, whatever it is, you know, the, art, the article of the day is. And I always say to myself, you know what else music education does for you? It gives you an education in music. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> and it's like it's almost forgotten. Yeah. I mean, music, one of the most, you know, art obviously affects everybody in throughout their lives. Um, even people who profess not to care for art in general, it permeates you. You can't yeah. go anywhere. There's architecture. You just open your eyes and it's, it's there. Music is, you know, ever present it's with you all the time you know elevator it used to be just the elevator now you go to the mall and the music you know it's it's, it's on all the time whether yeah. it's commercial or not and so you know a music education understanding more about music which as i get older it just gets more vast to me mm -hmm. there is no end to the you know you cannot find it. it's you know it's like physics they still it's it's the universe the music yeah. is as big as is that you know not quite as big as the universe, but the field of study of it, the field of knowledge, you know. Consistency among bass lines, consistency among the different products you offer. That's something that Upton Bass excels at. And here are Gary and Eric from Upton Bass on that topic. You know, like continuity of product, which we have fabulous reputation. We've got great product across the marketplace. Do you have seconds? No. Right, yeah, exactly, no. Seconds for in the dumpster. For almost 20 years, Upton Bass has been delivering top-notch bases at every price point. Consistency and continuity, like Gary said, across the line. And if the wood's not good, like Eric said, it goes in the dumpster. They are the real deal, made in America. Learn more at UptonBass.com, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by the A440 Violin Shop. It's located just down the street from Wrigley Field in beautiful Chicago on the north side, just off the Brown Line. I have been going there my entire adult life, and they have been fantastic, both for repairs. I've had cracks repaired. I've had seams glued. I've had all sorts of students go to A440 to get instruments, to get bows. They're available with a smile, do wonderful work, and definitely check them out if you are in the Midwest. A440violinshop.com. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast. I, I, you've got a, a bunch of really interesting posts and thoughts up on on your site uh, yeah. and and another one and i i can't remember all the points but that but it was a really interesting list um you may have posted this on social media too but it's it like a list of of things not to do on a gig oh yeah and, and, yes, and, and one that stuck out to me was it was like inappropriate dress and i right. i thought about that a lot um <laughs> having for a long time resisted buying the exact correct white coat for outdoor right. concerts. Right. And, and I, that's a story for another time, but like right. I've, I, do you remember some of the points? I do remember I'd love them. to dig into some of that. Okay. Yeah. So now here's the, this is more when you say, now here's the, the human, everything comes down to human nature, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, because we're humans. What, you know, now the question is, is, the person on the gig, either your coworker, and these are, we're talking about people who are seasoned professional musicians. Right. Are they going to remember your musical skill? Your musical skills, that's a given. You're going to be able to do that gig. Now, obviously, everybody in music business, even people who have a steady gig, like in an orchestra, they still have to rely, everybody does things on the outside even if you're in the chicago symphony you're going to go play a concerto you know yeah. you're going to do stuff on the outside so you have to rely on other humans to recommend you for these gigs <laughs> and to you know look good on you. you right and there are things what you want to avoid is what people will remember negatively about you and there's simple things that you don't think about that guy who came in wearing the wrong clothes he that will be remembered way longer for decades you will be remembered as the guy who did not have the, the white jacket yep. on the right gig yep. and you know you say why why but it's that's just the way human yes. nature is and so some of the other things on my list um that annoy things that i have found that have annoyed me and i was like why did they do that yeah people who send me emails and a lot of business is done almost all business is done by email right now. you get your gates but occasionally i'm driving and you're not allowed to text and drive, even though people do. 
and I need to call somebody because I got to get a piece of information for the gig we're doing. And I pull over and I scroll through the emails and the text and I are, well, the texts, I will know their phone number, but if it's just, and I don't know their phone number or if it's Facebook message, it's like, why have they not told me their phone number? Right. So the, the rule is put your phone number on every in your signature of every business mail you mm-hmm. send up because I want to scroll fast. Okay, there's this phone number. I have to call and get this piece yeah. of information. So that's another one. Well, I wish we had that that list in front of us. You know, let's pull it out. I, I, it's I, fun. Think, I, I think I I think I have it. I put it up on your on your site. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here, let me let me uh, find it here. I'll... All right, I'm not going to go through this whole thing. So <laughs> the, the, the email in your signature is really important. Yeah. Now, actually, I just did another one the other day that's not on this list, and that is when somebody calls you for a gig or emails you or texts you or whatever or Facebook messengers or whoever, if you're thinking about whether you can do the gig for 48 hours, mm-hmm. tell the person you're thinking about it. Don't just, you know, say, oh, okay, I'll get you say to yourself, I'll get back to them when I know. They're yeah. going to move on. Yeah, that's an incredibly important th- th- yeah. thing. Because sometimes we do have to think about it. And you just say, yeah. look, I will, I will get back to you by yes. tomorrow at 9 a.m. at the latest. It's a common courtesy, and people appreciate it. They're not yeah. going to be like, oh, why doesn't he know? No. What a contractor really wants to hear is they want to hear yes or no. They do not yeah. want to hear any maybes. But yeah. if you have to have a maybe, they will understand. It's not their first choice. Right. And right. we can go talk to next door is the um, is Dave Titcomb, the orchestra manager for the New York City Ballet and a bunch of other gigs. We could we could <laughs> and we could say, Dave, do you want to hear yes or no? And maybe and he'll say, I want to hear yes. I don't want to hear no. And I really don't want to hear maybe. But, yeah. you know, sometimes you have to. Right. So and the other one is if it turns out that you do not are if you are not able to do the job, tell the person I have been. Mm-hmm. I've been hiring people, and I said, "Well, can you make it?" And he says, "Oh, I can't make it." Well, why didn't you tell me? Oh, I thought you. I thought you knew. How am I going to know? No, if you didn't tell me. So yeah. it's like, yeah. and you, and you, people, you know, respond and say, "Well, isn't that obvious?" I'm like, "Yes, it should be obvious, but people don't do it." And you, you yeah. know, it's it's really, it's really funny. And I'm not, you know, getting down on people. I'm just saying, do this, do this, right. So. um I'm not going to go through the ones that involve artistry. I'll just do through the funny. <laughs> yes. So as I say, people will, will remember that if you show up with the wrong, even the wrong tie, you know, or the wrong, you know, oh, that guy wore white socks to the gig. I'm going to yep. remember that. You yep. know? And, you know, it's it's no big deal. No, but it's just a, it's a, you're presenting yourself as a package, you know, yes. and those details are, you know, they especially in the, in a sea of people wearing the same outfits, you know, those details stand out. Uh and yeah, they, you will remember. Now, um, here's an interesting one. Um, all expressions of complaints from you will be viewed by some others as negative to your own musicianship. Now, that doesn't make sense logically, but if you are the person who's always complaining, that's what people are going to remember you. That guy mm-hmm. complains. You know, it's like, well, if he says that about everybody else, what is he saying about me? Yeah. And that's going to, and as I say, it, when I say negative to your own musicianship, I mean your own professional musicianship. You know, yeah. they may say he is the greatest player I've ever heard, but uh, you know, he's the guy who complains. You know, mm-hmm. people and people, you know, as I say, give it, it that you are going to be doing the job is a given. Mm-hmm. That is the last issue of discussion whether somebody could do the job because it's a given. You're yeah. in this field. You've been, you know, you have paid your dues. So it's all these other things. Um, okay, this is an interesting one that people don't understand. Play a solo recital everyone remembers several decades after the first one. Now, this does get into a little bit of artistry, but I have known some musicians and who shall remain nameless who the old timers say, wow, they, that person is fantastic. I don't hear it. You know, I say, Really? Says yeah, in 1957 they played the soul the recital. It was the I mean it was the greatest recital everyone ever heard. Well, it's 1997, and you know, and or whatever, maybe not 1997, 1987, 30 years later, and I don't hear. It, but but that recital, I was like that was 30 years ago. So the point is, think about moving forward, yeah. even if you are as as jaded as they come, you know, that 
the jadedness is going to come across more than being um, more than your current level of ability. Mm -hmm. You know, the jadedness mm -hmm. is going to be like, well, I don't know. You know, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you have to move forward, or else you will you will stop and you will start moving backwards if you're not moving forward. And it seems I, something I've noticed. I remember talking with Michael Hovnani, Chicago Symphony bassist, about uh -huh. this, and he said. The, the, a key component for people who do move forward, it's it's having something outside of the orchestra job. Yes. If we're talking about people yes. with an orchestra job, it's incredibly rare to find somebody who is not in decline, yeah. <laughs> musical decline, uh, uh, who who's who's simply playing in the orchestra. Yeah. Whether, whether it's your chamber group or you're playing right. recitals actively or or what have you, that that seems to be a commonality. Well, another thing of human nature is that that I have learned over m my life is that um, uh, self denial knows no limits. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, you know you can fool yourself into thinking you are just as skilled at as doing something as you were twenty years ago, even yeah. if you haven't practiced it. And you know. I've seen that in myself and you yeah. have to really, you have to really get past that, you know, to say, wow, you know, really, you, I can't ride on that practice I did mm -hmm. 20 years ago, even, but you, you know, people, you can fool yourself and it, it is, is very, it's a very valid thing in human nature. Um, so that's how the decline happens, yeah. you know, because you're still thinking you're there mm -hmm. now. Um, it's not, and it's work to fight that. Right. You know, it's e it's way easier to say, well, I practiced back then, and I'm not practicing now, but I'm still there. I still have it. That's very easy to say. You know, that is uh, a very yeah. easy part of human nature. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've everybody's been there. This yeah. is absolutely not personal to anybody. Everybody has been there. You know. Well, I I'd love to circle back at the very beginning. You were talking sure. about a thousand nutcrackers. Yes, yes. Okay, oh. so and I I was in the Milwaukee Ballet for seven years, so I uh -huh. logged in my modest number of nutcrackers. But even mm -hmm. that, I I started and I've played a few shows where I've hit a hundred shows. I've never right. done anything beyond that. But for me, there's the there's the new factor, and then right. there's the I'm. I really know this piece well, and then yeah. it, and then it, I almost kind of go beyond it, and anything <clears throat> different that happens makes it really interesting. So yeah. I'd just love to hear your experience. That you know, we could do that first well, Nutcracker. That you know, the Nutcracker is um, almost a separate issue because you're talking about one of the most greatest masterpieces yeah. in the history of the world. Yeah, even though Tchaikovsky himself thought it was one of his lesser pieces, <laughs> right. you know, uh, so that it's almost different. But you, but it is as far as how, what it has taught me about mm -hmm. how to do that it's been very interesting because i have gotten bored with it or distracted over the years um you know when i had small children mm -hmm. obviously you're thinking about you know mm -hmm. how tired you are and how you you know where's my paycheck and i don't want to do this <laughs> but i <clears throat> i'd like to think that that was sort of a small part of my my career even though it was probably bigger of my jaded yeah, yeah. period so it's not just uh it can't just be about the actual playing of the music because right. if you just look at it that way you will get bored playing the same thing yeah. that's that's also very natural even if you're playing you know as i say one of the great masterpieces so there are things you have to figure out Mm -hmm. If you have a, if you're doing it a thousand times, you got plenty of time to figure yeah. out. Now, one of my tricks is that I think I put myself into the audience's perspective. The audience may be seeing it for the first time, or they only see it once a year. Obviously, everybody hears the Nutcracker on commercials right. all the time. But when you see the piece played from beginning to end, you realize that the true genius in it is how he is the music that is not the the TV commercial part. Right. And, um, and you're like, wow, this is like, it's not just those melodies. You say, this is a masterpiece. So you put yourself into the musician's perspective. That's one thing. Um, another thing is, um, and this is a little selfish. Um, it's two hours and it's got the greatest, 
It's two hours easy in a day, maybe mm -hmm. even two in a day. It's four hours out of your day. Um, it's got the greatest ratio of rehearsal to performance. Surely. <laughs> One yes. rehearsal and uh, 40 <laughs> and performances. <then> yeah. <laughs> and you're like, wow, you cannot beat that. You know, especially if you, you know, you use an orchestra concert where you have like four rehearsals and yeah. two performances or one performance. Right. You know? Right. So that's a trick. I mean, it's more than a trick. Um, you know, as I say, my third trick is that it is one of the greatest masterpieces of all time, and it's a privilege to bring it to life um, every year, you know. And you say, well, we here in the New York City Ballet, we do it more than anybody, you know, six weeks. You know, at the end of the six weeks, you're like, okay, we'll put it away for next year. <laughs> but I guarantee to myself and my colleagues, a month from now, you're going to be wishing we were still doing it. And most of them say, all right, yeah, you're probably right, you know. So, <clears throat> wow, I'm actually, you know, believe it or not, I'm looking forward to, let's see, we're in September, a couple months from now, we'll be in November, we start the last week of November with the Nutcracker, I'll be looking forward to it, you know. Okay, well, that's great to hear, that's a, it's, that's a, that's a, good to hear, and, and, uh, and, uh, anybody I, it could very well be the opposite for somebody yeah. you know something like that so it's right. great to hear that it's not like this this death mark that, <laughs> that you embark upon every every uh late fall early winter and then the other thing i say another trick i say is well it could be it's the nutcracker it could be even a masterpiece let's take mm -hmm. another masterpiece romeo and juliet mm -hmm. that which is Another unbelievable oh, yeah. masterpiece, Procopio's Romeo and Juliet. That is brutal, hard, um, percussive playing for two hours. Yeah. That is hard on the fingers. And um, you could say that, if you say that, it could be that. Oh. Playing the Nutcracker is like, wow. Twice you know? a day. Yeah. Because <laughs> Nutcracker is basically downbeats. There's not a lot of, you know. Yeah. There's not a lot of brutality on on the hands. I mean, I, um, we do, we do when we do Romeo and Juliet, we wind up doing a week of it, mm -hmm. and it is just it is brutal. Yeah, you know, as yeah. masterpieces it is. And I say, would you rather play? Let's take the greatest masterpiece of all time. I don't know, Beethoven's Ninth, mm -hmm. right? You could play the Nutcracker every day indefinitely once a day you couldn't do that with beethoven's knife right you just cannot it's too much yeah you could not get around that mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. peace it may it works yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well i i appreciate you sitting down and chatting this is super fun and there's so there's so much we get we can't even begin to scratch the surface yeah. of everything but i do i uh the only thing I ask everybody is advice for your younger self, like yeah. Indiana University, Ron, or before or after that. You pick the age, but what would you what would you tell that younger Ron? Well, here's here's the thing, and it's it's going to be almost it's going to be almost um, it's going to be almost against almost everything I've ever said. Sure, but. You know, from someone who always felt a little entrepreneurial and wanted to do gigs, I, I might almost say to myself, spend a little more time practicing and not think about all that because mm -hmm. you have this this great time when you're young to mm -hmm. do that, you know, and um, you could obviously we all want to be or I'm sure everybody who's listening to this podcast wants to be the best bass player they can be. You know, you don't. You only have that chance when you're young. I mean, you can improve when you're older. But if I, th I think I could have been a little bit better than I am now if I had spent a little bit more time practicing back then. Yeah. You know, and it's instead of getting distracted by, oh, do I have this gig? And you know, I'm, I'm, you know, so you can't really do that at the same time. I mean, you can, but it's a really good season of your life, though, yeah. for for really improving. And it's it's interesting uh, to see because some people have been very successful at kind of kind of a hermiting up a bit, you know, in terms of, in terms of not going around and playing a, a ton of gigs at that right. age and just really getting really, right. you know, leveling up and seeing music and, and yeah, I distracted uh, myself a little bit too much. I think that, I mean, I'm, I, this is not from a regretful standpoint, right, of course. Yeah. You know, cause I, I've had, I have had a nice career and I've had, a bit, I felt 
overly lucky, you know, yeah. as is, that's one of the actually being, being, it's one of the reasons that I have done all my extracurricular stuff and that I say I have donated, mm -hmm. um, towards these other extra musical crews because I feel like I want to sort of share the luck that I've had and hire young musicians. And I, I don't insist on hiring young people in my, in my New York jazz harmonic or whatever, but it's just, those are the people who've been available and, who, right. and I'm you know thrilled that I can hire people for actual jobs that are, you know, that are, that are, they look forward to, yeah, you know, absolutely. Well, I can't wait to follow along with the jazz harmonica. I look up to that <laughs> and I, everything that you do. And thanks for uh, yeah. making the time. Hey, listen, can I just talk about one other thing? As long Be as we, my guest, please. Long, while I please. still have a voice. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just wanted to say, like, you know, we're talking about young people. Um, one of one of my, my inspirations, and this is a shout out to uh, a, a musician I met. I met two musicians uh, a few years, about three or four years ago, four or five years ago, who were incredibly talented people who came into their young lives and said, I'm going to be, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to be a professional musician. The first one was um, this guy, J.P. Joffrey, who asked me to be in his tango band. And we actually were doing some piazzola at the ballet. And he, um, we, he came recommended and I was doing the arrangements and we said, we need a Bandonian player. So he came and he came in and he said, this is great. It's a great job. He says, but I have my own band and would you like to, you know, do a couple of gigs with us? And I was like, what do you do? Do you do Pete's all arrangements? He says, no, I write my own music. And he, I came into his, his, he did a couple of gigs with his tango band and I was absolutely you know, wowed at the level of this guy's talent and his music. And he says, I'm going to make it. And sure enough, now four or five years ago, four or five years later, he is now around the world constantly touring as a soloist, you know, and the people he introduced me to the like-minded young people who were, had the same mindset. Um, I, I I don't want to say every valuable person I've met is through him, but almost all the young musicians I've met are through him, um, including my um, associate with the New York Jazz Harmonic, uh, Miho Hazama, who is an incredibly talented composer. She is now also an international phenomenon doing arrangements for, um, um, you know, the big bands in Europe, which is a different story we didn't. Mm. So, you know, the irony being that as we are here, um, so well established in philanthropy for the European art form of classical music in Europe, they're much better at the American art form of the jazz big band. You know, they're doing it much better and there's governmental support. Um, but, um, except in military bands here, we said, mm -hmm. yeah, right. You know, right. So I met Miho through J JP, and I said, Miho, I'm starting a big band. Would you like to write a piece for me? And she said, no, I want to help you put it together. You know, And she saw the value in having an institution rather than the, you know, the Ron Wasserman big band, mm -hmm. you know, having something mm -hmm. like the New York Jazz Harmonic. So these people have been incredibly inspiring, you know, just talent off the charts. I mean, if I see talent... I want to just be a, I just want to be near it. You yeah. know, just that is like the most gratifying thing in my life. Just to, just to, just let some of that talent, um, you know, and whatever I can do to help, you know, I do the same thing with my, um, colleague Ashley Bowder when we do our dance projects. It's like, there's just so much unbelievable talent. I will just say, let me just be a part of it. Yeah. Just and whatever I can do, whatever skills, entrepreneurial skills I've developed over the years. So that, is been the you know the most gratifying thing in my life just to be just to take this in i'm also lucky that my wife lets me do whatever i want to do <laughs> you know a few years ago when my kids were young i said i want to buy a boat she's like all right you know um i said i want to build a neapolitan pizza oven in the backyard she says all right you know and i said i want to start a jazz big band and a concert series and she was like ah uh, she thought about that. Okay. All right. She's all right. You know, <laughs> so, you know, that, that I've been lucky that way too. So it's great. Well, 
great tip i'll enjoy following along with the pizza oven if you still got it yes oh that yes and i've been so uh, busy this summer i've only had a chance to fire it up a couple times but i'm doing it for my birthday tomorrow oh great well happy early birthday yes thank you our late birthday when this comes out yes thank you yeah let's do this again sometime yeah thank you jason yeah thanks for a pleasure Yeah. yeah Ron, thanks again. We got to do it again soon for sure. And folks, learn more about everything Ron's up to at his website, trilateris.com. Link to that and everything else we talked about in the show notes. What fun to talk with Ron about all these topics. I learned so much. And this is the beauty of this show. It's, it's for me, selfishly, personally, it's a vehicle to have conversations like this. We're all so busy doing whatever it is we happen to do that we really, it's really hard to find the time to sit down for an hour, an hour and a half or what have you to chat about topics like this. And the podcast is a nice vehicle for having a conversation. I've said this many times, but a conversation that I would want to have anyway. So even if there was no podcast, I would want to be doing this and that I can put it out to the greater world is just this added benefit. Something many podcasters have say said <laughs> over the years, but I totally think that's true. I get such enjoyment from doing that. And I am so thrilled that people are listening and I know they're listening because they reach out to me and let me know they like the show. And they do that. <laughs> Very circuitous way of letting you know my email address, which is feedback at contrabaseconversations.com. So let me know what you thought about this show or who else you'd like to hear or the next time I sit down with Ron, what you'd like us to cover. That would be great. And also you can learn about all the hundreds and hundreds of guests we've had on the podcast over our, I think, 11 years now at this point, maybe more than that, at our website site contrabaseconversations.com. Contrabase Conversations is produced by Steve Hinchy, Michael Cooper, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. If you're looking for a bass, Mitch makes beautiful instruments. They sound great. They look great. And you can check them out at his website, mitchmooring.com. And thank you also to Krista Copper for archiving and cataloging and organizing all these conversations. Super helpful as we move forward. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Bye.